day with morning hour time set aside for short speeches on any topic. Legislative work starting today at noon with the House today considering five bills, including one to authorize new veterans care facilities in California, Missouri, and Puerto Rico. Now live to the House floor here on C-SPAN. Minority whip limited to five minutes each, but in no event shall debate continue beyond 1.50 p.m. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Dreyer, for five minutes. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, uh, it was with great sadness that we received the news uh, this past weekend of the passing of um, one of my longtime family friends and one of the most dedicated public servants I've ever had the privilege of knowing or serving with. I'm referring, of course, to Senator Charles Percy, who passed away Saturday morning at the age of 91. Senator Percy was someone whom I first met when I was a kid at summer camp in Colorado. And uh, tragically, his daughter Valerie had been murdered. And of course, her twin is uh, Sharon Percy Rockefeller, uh, who uh, serves with great distinction as the head of the WETA board and uh, many other civic duties here in Washington, D.C. But I met Senator Percy when uh, we were at Valerie Lodge, which was named for his daughter at camp in California. And at that moment, Mr. Speaker, I saw someone who was clearly very dedicated and extraordinarily principled. And his entire life was dedicated to public service and uh, doing everything he possibly could to ensure that um, life was better for uh, all around him. And I came to Congress a little more than a decade after I had met him when I was at summer camp, and um, he immediately took me under his wing. He made the pilgrimage from the Senate here to the House of Representatives and visited me in my office several times, and I took my first trip with him to Mexico, and uh, it was the U.S.-Mexico Interparliamentary Conference. And I remember very vividly, nearly three decades ago, uh, well, actually three decades ago, what it is that he said, Mr. Speaker. He talked about the challenge in the relationship between the United States and Mexico, and he characterized his remarks as it related to his twin daughters, Sharon and Valerie. And in that speech, he said, so many people talk about twins and the similarities. And he said, for me, the greatness is to look at the differences between the two. And he carried that personal message as he referred to the challenging relationship between the United States of America and Mexico. And I was struck with that. He was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and uh, I was uh, privileged to serve two terms here in the House while he served in the Senate. And I want to say to his wonderful wife, Lorraine, and to all of the other children and relatives and friends of Senator Charles Percy, uh, he led an amazing life, and it was one that was an inspiration to me and uh, I will greatly miss him. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Boren, for five minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to mourn the loss of Ima Jean Johnson of Okima, Oklahoma, who passed away on September 14, 2011, at the age of 90. Imi, as we all knew her, was a very close friend of the Bourne family, and I can remember seeing her face at some of my earliest campaign events. She was always there. She was the wife of Oklahoma 4th District Congressman Glenn D. Johnson, Sr., and the mother to Glenn D. Johnson, Jr., the former Speaker of the Oklahoma House of Representatives, and now our current Chancellor for higher education. She supported both her husband and her son faithfully. And I know her son especially will miss her. Imi was a civic leader and a dedicated public servant. She was a member of the Okima Chamber of Commerce, an active member and past president of the American Legion Auxiliary, and a member of the PEO. In 1999, the city of Okima honored her by inducting her into the Okima Hall of Fame for her dedication to her hometown. Imi was truly an inspiration to her beloved Oklahoma, 
and I'm honored to have called her a friend. Again, we are all going to miss her. Uh, so many of us, I know she has uh, family scattered across uh, the state of Oklahoma, particularly in Okima, uh, her son, and many, many other Oklahomans uh, who she has touched. Again, we will greatly miss her, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Illinois, Mrs. Biggert, for five minutes. Without objection. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to pay tribute to a man who served Illinois, our country, and people from other nations around the world for decades before his death this weekend at age 91. That man is Senator Charles H. Percy of Illinois. Already his life, legend, and list of accomplishments as a senator, a statesman, and a larger-than-life political, uh, political figure are well documented. Others have articulated these things far better than I could today, and I'm confident that history will recount them as well. But, Mr. Speaker, what I wish to convey today are the warm and wonderful stories and the testimonies about Chuck Percy that have only come to me from those who knew him and loved him and those whose views and sentiments I hold in the highest regard. Their stories are not always uh, the well suited for publication or statements uh, on the House or, or Senate floor, but they are funny, warm, endearing, and genuine. They reflect the incredible love of life, humanity, and humor that made working for or with Senator Percy so in, incomparable. These volunteers, former members, and political leaders cannot address the House about him today, but I can, and it is my honor to do so. There are some of the finest leaders of Illinois today, the state controller, Judy Bartopinko, who launched her first campaign for office uh, years ago after serving as a Percy campaign coordinator. They are State Treasurer Don Rutherford and U.S. Senator Mark Kirk, who served on the Youth for Percy Brigade. Uh, they are former Congre Congresswoman and U.S. Uh, Labor Secretary Lynn Martin, whose very first campaign as a volunteer was to help elect Chuck Percy. And you just heard from Representative Dave Dreyer on his reflections of, of his uh, being with uh, Chuck Percy. If you talk to them, they will say that the enthusiasm and commitment to making a better state, country, and world are what motivated them to answer the call and launch their own political careers. His energy and enthusiasm, his openness to offering views, and his passion for improvement were infectious. They will tell you of a dark moment of loss or sadness or disappointment in their lives when he was there for them with a, a loving phone call or note. He was, in a word, an inspiration to all of them. They are former Illinois governors, Jim Thompson and Jim Edgar, whose natural talents thrived under Chuck Percy's guidance and inspiration. He saw in them the makings of outstanding leaders, and they succeeded in their own right. He never looked over his shoulder, worrying about those who might challenge his own leadership. He embraced them, encouraged them, and made them a success to his success. Unlike others in politics today, his generosity to others was boundless and without the slightest hint of envy or competitiveness. With Chuck per Percy, there was no zero sum. There was only pl pluses for everyone. They also gave the other leaders out there are also the other leaders outside of Illinois. The former HUD secretary and USTR Ambassador Carla Hills, who first headed uh, Percy's alliance to save energy in the 1970s and when it became clear to Percy that our reliance on foreign oil was unsustainable. Their former S Senator Fred Thompson, in whom Percy saw a brilliant prosecutor and future star of the Senate. There are those who went on to become leaders in their own countries, like the late Prime Minister of India, Rajiv Gandhi, and President of Lebanon, Ravik Hareri, both of whom strove, strove for peace and tragically were cut down by assassination. They are federal district and appellate court judges and a Supreme Court justice whose service to our country might never have been possible were it not for the fact that Chuck Percy believed in them and believed that the cronyism and, and corruption in judicial selection must end. He saw 
in them a commitment to the law, the Constitution, and justice, and with them help to transform the Illinois Bar from one of those the most corrupt in the country to one of those the most respected. And last but not least, there are thousands of st staff members and volunteers whose lives were forever changed and guided by this dear man whom they referred to simply as C CHP or the Senator. They are a formidable network of outstanding individuals who are devoted to him as they each are to each other and to the public service. Each of them has gone on to do good things because of the confidence that he inspired in them and the belief and his belief that everything is possible if only you want to work hard enough for it. They are my constituents and volunteers. They are my chief of staff, Kathy Lydon, and chief of volunteers, Carolyn Stillman, and many others, and all the outstanding people that I've met through their fellowship. They are hundreds of Illinois and Washington businessmen, lawyers, teachers, homemakers, and yes, even reporters whose lives have, were forever changed by this special man. To a one they would say, there is no one, no one quite like Chuck Percy. So today, Mr. Speaker, I want to say to them and to the Percy family, Lorraine, Sharon, and Senator Jay, Roger, and Penny, Gail, and Wade, Mark, and Leslie, and all of their wonderful children and grandchildren and family that our thoughts and prayers are with you. We thank you for sharing this wonderful man with us, with the people of Illinois, America, and the world. I yield back. The gentleman yields back her time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, for five minutes. Let me thank the speaker for yielding this time this morning to pay tribute to some great Americans. Uh, I want to uh, join my colleague from Illinois, Ms. Biggerts, in recognizing the extraordinary life and work of Senator Charles Percy. Uh, he will certainly be missed. Also, I want to extend condolences to the Mondale and Kennedy families, uh, who also lost a daughter this weekend at the young age of 51. But, Mr. Speaker, I've come to the well today to pay tribute to another great American, uh, to a friend in North Carolina who has lost a long but courageous battle to breast cancer at the age of 51. Mrs. Cassandra Lloyd Ward was the daughter of Johnny and Mary Lloyd of Williamston, North Carolina. She was also the wife of Mr. Everett B. Ward. Uh, for 29 long years, they were married. Uh, Everett is a well-respected public servant uh, in North Carolina with our State Department of Correction. Uh, excuse me, the State Department of Transportation. Cassandra was a career educator in Wake County, North Carolina. Many of you will recognize that as our capital city of Raleigh. Uh, she worked for many years in the Wake County public schools. The epitome of educational excellence, Cassandra touched the lives of countless individuals who have now become productive citizens in our communities across America. Cassandra was employed by the Wake County School System beginning with Young, Youngsville Elementary, Henry Adams Elementary, Dillard Drive Elementary, and finally Forest Pines Elementary School. She was a lifelong member of the North Carolina Association of Educators. Cassandra Ward, Mr. Speaker, was a graduate of Williamston High School in Martin County, North Carolina, also a graduate of Historic St. Augustine's College in our capital city of Raleigh, which is an HBCU, a historically black college there in the Raleigh community. As a member of Davis Street Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, uh, Cassandra was a church leader, uh, not only a member of the Presbyterian Church, but she was also a deacon in the church. She advocated that the church serve the least of these in our society. She was a member of a great uh, sorority, the Alpha, Phi Alpha, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, uh, in that capacity uh, as a member of the Alpha Theta Omega Chapter. Uh, she served and chaired uh, many committees, uh, particularly the Black Family, Black Heritage, Health, Social, and Sisterly Relations, uh, Salvation Army and Christmas stocking uh, stuffing committees. Those were a lot of committees, and Mr. Speaker. She was a very active individual. Uh, she also found time to be uh, associated uh, with the Gamma Sigma Bole uh, of Sigma Phi Pi Phi fraternity, 
Uh, she was what w was referred to as an Arcusa. Uh, it took me a while, Mr. Speaker, to figure out how to pronounce that word, but she was an Arcusa uh, of Gamma Sigma Boule of Sigma Pi Phi fraternity. Mr. Speaker, Cassandra Ward leaves a very, very loving family. In addition to her parents and her husband, she leaves three siblings, Johnny Lloyd Jr., Jarvis Lloyd, and one loving sister that she was extremely close to, Crystal Lloyd Williams, and her sister-in-law, Felicia Hardy, and her husband, Dr. James Hardy. And so, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you for the time. Uh, it looks like I failed to mention one or two other relatives, and while I have a few seconds left, I would like to do that. Uh, she is also survived by other relatives and friends, uh, and especially uh, her very special nieces and nep nephews, uh, Johnny Lloyd III, uh, Alicia Hardy, Jarvis Lloyd, and, and Ebony, and Jamie Hardy, and Jamisha Hardy, and Mary Noel Williams, and a young lady named Gabrielle Williams. They all comprise uh, the wonderful family of Cassandra Lloyd Ward. I ask my colleagues today to join with me in honoring the life and work of this great American, Cassandra Lloyd Ward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Frank, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today is a very important day in our fight to achieve full equality for all Americans in the face of prejudices of various sorts. And to commemorate, I want to read an extraordinary document. It is headlined, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, Repeal. It's an official communication. Today marks the end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. The law is repealed. From this day forward, gay and lesbian soldiers may serve in our army with the dignity and respect they deserve. Our rules, regulations, and policies reflect the repeal guidance issued by the Department of Defense and will apply uniformly without regard to sexual orientation, which is a personal and private matter. For over 236 years, the U.S. Army has been an extraordinary force for good in the world. Our soldiers are the most agile, adaptable, and capable warriors in history and we are ready for this change. Over the last several months, our leaders, soldiers and Department of the Army civilians have discussed, trained, and prepared for this day. The President, the Secretary of Defense, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff have certified that a repeal is consistent with military readiness, effectiveness, unit cohesion, and recruiting and retention. Your professionalism, leadership, and respect for your fellow soldiers will ensure that this effort is successful. At the heart of our success is adherence to the Army values. These standards not only infuse every facet of our culture and operations, but also guide us as we adopt to change. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage are not mere words to us. They are the very principles by which we live, train, and fight. Accordingly, we expect all personnel to follow our values by implementing the repeal fully fairly and in accordance with policy guidance. It is the duty of all personnel to treat each other with dignity and respect while maintaining good order and discipline throughout our ranks. Doing so will help the U.S. Army remain the strength of the nation. And it is signed by Raymond F. Chandler III, the Sergeant Major of the Army, Raymond T. Odierno, General and the United States Army Chief of Staff, and John M. McHugh, Secretary of the Army, parenthetically our former colleague on the Republican side. Mr. Speaker, we have a history in this country of prejudice being enacted. And through the efforts of many people, the policy embodying that prejudice can be overcome. And as we debate any single effort to overcome prejudice, we are told that the effect of diminishing that prejudice, the effect of repealing that rule will be chaos, will be disorder, will be social unrest. And it is never true. Seven years ago, the state I am privileged to represent in this House established same-sex marriage, and there were predictions of doom, predictions that this would be a terribly upsetting factor. None of those predictions have come true, not a one. As we debated last year, the repeal of the unfortunate statute 
which said that brave and patriotic gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender members of the armed services would have to lie about who they were, would have to hide who they were, or else lose the right to serve their country, a right which some evade, but for which they were prepared to fight. We once again heard predictions that this would be disruptive, that it would cause diminution of the ability of our brave men and women to serve their purposes. Let me predict today, Mr. Speaker, that every single one of those prejudices will, three and four years from now, have been proven as wrong as the predictions that same-sex marriage would be disorganizing. We will now see gay men and lesbians serving this country openly and proudly, as they have been serving this country proudly, but unfortunately not openly for some time. And I hope that people are now making note of the predictions that were made on the floor of this House, in the Senate, and in the country about the negative consequences of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, because they will soon be shown to have been wholly false. And finally, I want to commend Sergeant Major Chandler, General Journal, Secretary McHugh. This is a very profound and important document. They are acting in the highest traditions of their constitutional duty, of patriotism, and of respect for our constitutional principles. I welcome this statement, and I believe it is going to be proven to be a harbinger of a situation in which the full integration of gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender members of the military goes forward with no negative consequences, with all the positive consequences that come from respecting people and abolishing prejudice. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. With, without objection. Mr. Chairman, I rise this morning to pay tribute to a great American who lived in the state of Illinois, who represented it and the country well, Senator Charles Percy. I recall that when Senator Percy was elected, I was a young school teacher, community activist, and I also was an individual who interacted with lots of people who were very cynical about government, politics, whether or not there was any potential for change. And so we had an opportunity to see in action one of the most forceful individuals in public life one that you didn't describe necessarily as a Democrat or a Republican. You didn't characterize him as a conservative or a liberal. You really thought of Senator Percy as simply a good, solid United States senator who represented well not only his constituents, but who provided leadership for the nation and for the country. I think I learned at that time the meaning of town hall meetings because Senator Percy would hold those. And although he was a Republican by political stripe and many of the people where I lived and interacted were Democrats in terms of political stripe, we just would turn out at Senator Peirce's town halls to know what was taking place, what was going on, what was happening. And so I personally owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to him for helping to shape my own political philosophy, some of my political ideology, some of the things that I dream about and hope for and work towards. And so I extend condolences to his family, wish them well, and know that America is a better place because Chuck Percy served in the United States Senate and served all of America. I thank you, Mr. Speaker and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time.
Pursuant to Clause 12A of Rule 1, the Chair declares the House in recess until 2 p.m. today. The House returns at 2 Eastern for legislative work. Members will consider five bills, among them...